To understand Flock, you have to understand this man, Valdemar Velasquez, its leader, revered by his followers, but despised by the farmers. Valdemar Velázquez was born into a family of migrant farm workers in South Texas struggling for survival and taken advantage of by global corporations. But he stood up for himself and for his people. And over the course of his career, he's brought major corporations to their knees. He started the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, also known as FLOC, in 1967 when he was only 20 years old. Years of strikes, boycotts, marches, and court cases have taken their toll on Valdemar, but music has helped him through it. I took a road trip to Toledo, Ohio, not only to talk to Baldemar about his lifetime fighting for underdogs, but also to just pick some tunes. Like Joe Hill, Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, and Hazel Dickens, he has used songs to motivate working class people to fight against the odds and sing their way to change. I've always been amazed by how music can open people's hearts and minds, and I wanted to learn from a legendary union organizer how he's used music to make a movement. I didn't notice that till now. <laughs> I'm Baldemar Velasquez, president of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, AFL-CIO, the union, uh, for uh, workers to learn about how to stand up for their rights and be educated about what their rights are. Baldemar, why do you do the work that you do? Seeing the mistreatment of my dad, my mom, my siblings, you know, the wage theft, experiencing the atrocious living and squalor, it's something that no family, children particularly, should have to do. Even as a young person, I decided when I grew up, if I could do something about this, I was going to do something. And I wouldn't say it's a career I chose, but it's one that chose me. You were born in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, mm -hmm. uh, far Texas to be exact. What was life like for a migrant farm worker back in the 1940s and 50s? Like a lot of poor people that are stuck in poverty, we thought that that's the way life was. Um, you're poor and you're taken advantage of. And as a child, uh, the only thing you can do is, you know, look up to the older people and see the busyness of their life, getting ready to go to work, and coming home, trying to cook meals, and all this busyness around you. And you're a little kid watching all this, knowing that life is... Um, sparse in terms of food and things like that so you grow up thinking um, where's my next meal gonna come from the things that I remember as a little kid uh, you're, you're four or five years old the first trip from Texas to Ohio as migrant workers in a, a flatbed truck and with a canvas thrown over the top and five or six families crammed in the back trying to keep warm at night and all the kids huddled up to their parents uh, hearing the drones of the tire that was our lullaby so to speak it's sort of i think about those wheels churning and humming and humming and humming as you're on those uh two-lane highways taking you five six days to get to ohio to cover the 16 1700 miles the song needs no introduction, one day at a time, in Mexican. <laughs> Me encuentro, Señor. Ayúdame hoy. Yo quiero saber lo que debo hacer. Muestra el camino. But the things that stand out a lot about those trips is the lack of places where we could stop and go bathrooms, right. find water. Because there was a lot of discrimination against Mexican people. 
there's historical signs, you know, no, no Mexicans or dogs allowed, no use the N-words and Mexicans or dogs allowed. Uh, and I remember on one stop, wanted to break down and buy some sandwiches and having to have to go to the back of this restaurant in a window where Mexicans and blacks would purchase us food because we couldn't go inside. And bathrooms, forget it. Particularly the one year that we went, we didn't go the panhandle route, we went through Texarkana, through the deep south. Uh, there the, the segregation was very uh, prevalent. And then you, then you saw the, the signs, you know, the black drinking fountains and the white drinking fountains, black and white. Well, we didn't think of ourselves as either. I said, well, where do we go? But we, we avoided all those things because we didn't want to get in trouble with anybody. We, went, we needed to get to our destination. Uh, we, we knew that if anything delayed us, it would mean money, it would mean opportunity, it would mean jobs. And we did as much as we could just to uh, stay out of trouble. And, did you uh, interpret all of this as a child as discrimination? In those days, uh, we didn't have those words in our vocabulary. Uh, it was just the way it was. And you didn't question it till much later in life when you began to expand your, your um, knowledge of life and how other people lived. But after our second trip up here, we got stranded in Port Clinton, Ohio, because we had been picking peaches up there. Uh, my dad got sick and we didn't make enough money to pay the truck driver to take us back to Texas. So we had to stay. Our first winter in Ohio, we had no idea how cold it got up here. Oh, Lord. Because in the Rio Grande Valley, we, we didn't even have heaters in our homes. How did you survive the winter? We had to move into the kitchen of that old farmhouse because our only heat source was the stove. What, what were the labor camps like? In those days, traditionally, they were one-room shanties. They're just shacks, like one-room shacks. The farmers bought those and put them on their property, and that was our housing for the migrant workers. There was nothing in it, nothing. No electricity, no nothing. All you had is, was the stove. And um, whatever bedding you had, you had to roll it up every morning because you needed the space to, you know, to live. But uh, at night, you would roll it out again, and, and uh, everybody was crammed on the floor. What sustained you at the end of a long day when you were just exhausted and, and you still had to keep working, what, what helped you keep going? One of the things that, that impacted me the most was my mom and her singing. She would strike up, start singing a song. And my mom, um, when she was a teenager, her and her sister would sing in my grandfather's band. My grandfather played the fiddle and my uncle, Eladio, played the guitar. They would have this little band there in the Rio Grande Valley and, you know, they would play for weddings and parties and things like that. Que lejos estoy del suelo y un día nacido Que amarga nostalgia invade mi pensamiento Y al verme tan solo y triste Quisiera 
anytime anyone sang, it was kind of like a, an uplift. And someone with a lot of energy sparks everybody else around you, and music is one of those things that, um, that was so important. In those days, it's just like a lot of old uh, Mexican folk tunes. has done throughout history. I think what makes a person a human being or something to live for is, is, is whether you're able to, to put your hand out to help someone else. If you can't do that, I don't know why you're in this world to do that.